I'm very grateful um, for this invitation to speak today. And um, he pinched my joke. <laughs> I was going to borrow a phrase from Oscar Wilde, I feel like a lion in a den of Daniels. <laughs> I certainly feel like an alien creature at a humanist conference. Um, it is a delight, however, for me to be here. It's also, um, I think, a good choice of venue. The Royal Society embodies the Enlightenment values of intellectual and scientific thought, and, if you'll forgive me, has one of its founders uh, as a Church of Scotland minister. It's often true that religion or faith is held up as a reason for opposing assisted dying. Only the other day, you will have read as I read, a report in the BBC of the Jersey decision that, and what the BBC reported was that one deputy said that despite her beliefs, she agreed with the proposition. Acknowledging that assisted dying is about choice, she is reported to have said, I would never want anyone to restrict my choices on something that impacts on me and my body, regardless of my faith. I have no right to do that. Regardless of my faith, I do not mock or question her view, but as a minister of the church for some 28 years now, I am not certain what she means when she says by her beliefs or faith. Regularly, it seems people say they oppose the introduction of assisted dying legislation on the grounds of their religion or faith. But what does that actually mean? And I think if you're faced with that, you should try and explore that with someone, unpack it. She was right in one regard, the deputy. Churches have a voice in this debate, and that's the way it should be, but they do not have a veto. I take the view that there is nothing in religious belief or faith per se that means people of faith cannot support such legislation. And that's what we'll be saying today. You may know that on this topic, um, as most others, there is a spectrum of views within faith communities. The principle of assisted dying is supported by people who belong to the Church of England, Church of Scotland, Church of Wales, Catholicism, the Baptist Church, Methodism, the URC, and more widely, Quakerism, Liberal and Reform Judaism, and Sunni Islam. Perhaps a fair comparison um, of the situation in the churches is with that of the BMA. In the past, the official position of the BMA was set resolutely against the principle of AD, though that position did not fully reflect the views of all doctors. So it is in the churches, including the Church of Scotland. We may hear official statements outlining the position of the Kirk, but that view, to this point at least, has not been inclusive of the spectrum of views held by Christians. And I think that's very important because the media tends to say it's a religious view to oppose, and it's not true. As a a, a, a spiritual person, so let me give you a justification from where I'm coming from. As a spiritual person, the unnameable mystery we call God is central to my life. I hear echoes of that transcendence in the teachings of Jesus and others. For myself, Jesus embodies love, compassion, tenderness, forgiveness, dignity, respect, humanity, and humaneness. All of that is to the fore, and because of that, I am drawn to supporting assisted dying legislation, at least in some form, for those, for example, who are terminally ill and mentally sound. For me, assisted dying legislation is centered on the relief of suffering, the avoidance of indignity, and the honoring of humanity. Compassion means to put yourself into the shoes of another, in this case, another who is suffering intolerably. 
For those who are dying, there is clear evidence that once they have been given permission to have an assisted death, this news brings peace, reduces anxiety, and improves the quality of life for the time remaining. The church wishes to avoid all harm, yet by allowing life to be prolonged, it ends up, in a sense, extending the period of harm. And so the title of this um, is about religious beliefs not being at odds with assisted dying. Let me say clearly, there is nothing in the Bible, nothing, which explicitly excludes the principle of assisted dying. What we are talking about now in our time was not an ethical issue in the biblical period. Biblical texts may be stretched one way or another, but assisted dying, as we understand it, was not their issue. I have heard some cite the commandment, thou shalt not kill, but nothing in the Bible should ever be taken at face value. A common mistake of humanists, as you know. <laughs> um, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, the commandment actually says, thou shalt not kill unlawfully. That's quite a difference. It's also worth noting that um, the very first encounter in the great story of the Old Testament, the very first encounter Moses has with God is when God says, I have heard the cry of my people. In the ancient myth of Moses and God, the very first words of God to Moses articulate compassion for those who are powerless degraded and suffering intolerably. But there is nothing explicit in scripture, in the Christian scriptures, the Judaic scriptures, which um, stands against assisted dying as we understand it. Let me just expand on some of the things the Church of Scotland has said in the past um, and just really respond to those very briefly. So the Church of Scotland, as I see it, accepts the principle of taking life. It commends the work of the armed forces, which do peacekeeping and at times kill. Chaplains bless our nuclear submarines. More generally, churches accept the theory of just war. In civilian life, the church accepts the use of lethal force by police forces in certain circumstances under specific guidance. Of course, a person who is opting for an assisted death is not having their life taken away without their consent. But the point is that there are, there are already circumstances when the churches accept the taking of life. Another phrase you'll sometimes hear is the sanctity of life. This is not a biblical concept. It's not there in the Bible, and it's not an absolute. And if you're presented with the argument, the sanctity of life, I would say, first of all, that longevity of life does not trump quality of life. And if, you're, if people present you with these slogans, same in politics, they present you with a slogan, ask them to unpack it, find out what the rationale underlying it is. And there really is no biblical rationale to the sanctity of life. Over the past 20 to 30 years, a number of prominent church theologians and leaders have spoken in favor of the principle of assisted dying. It's a long time. For me, the most notable is the Swiss-born Catholic theologian, the late Hans Kuhn, once described by Richard Holloway as the greatest living theologian. Hans Kuhn supported assisted dying in the 1990s because from the bedside, he endured the agonizing death of his brother. In sometimes graphic terms, Kuhn wrote of organs failing one after the other. As a theologian, Kuhn asked, is this the sort of death God wants? He said the only answer to that question has to be no. In the 1990s, Kung expressed very well a theology which supports individual choice. 
Other notable voices include former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, the former Archbishop and Nobel Prize winner, Desmond Tutu, and the Bishop Jean Robinson of New Hampshire, the first openly gay priest to be consecrated as bishop. So these are notable figures from around the world who have supported assisted dying. Over the years, I have had many conversations with members of the wider church community who are opposed to assisted dying. What I've heard, and this is important, this seems to me to get to the heart of what I've been asked to speak about, is what I've heard when I've spoken to people who are opposed to assisted dying within the Christian community is that is there's a fear of the slippery slope, of concerns over disability and abuse of legislation, but also quite reasonably a hesitation, not on grounds of faith, but holding doubts about the framing of legislation carefully and concerns about ethical medical practice. It is rare, in my experience, that anyone has raised concerns on grounds of faith. Now, it may be labelled a ground of faith, but when you actually go into, the, into what they're actually saying, it is the kind of argument you will hear across society. When we push people to articulate their faith objection, it is most often not what one might call a narrowly faith-based objection, but concerns that we hear elsewhere. And that's been my experience over 10, 12 years. I take the view that as more and more states and countries adopt assisted dying legislation in some form, the more, it, the more difficult it is to make some of the arguments against its introduction. Like others have said, we have to face the legal and moral nonsense that the people in the UK travel abroad for an assisted death. There's a moral problem, that's a moral problem, that the churches need to answer. How is it okay to let people travel abroad? People of faith, individuals within faith communities, have travelled abroad for an assisted death. Clergy have supported people who have chosen an assisted death. We also need to be honest about the medical practice of double effect, which surely is disingenuous. In my own uh, professional practice, it's not my place to persuade a parishioner that, he, that they should or should not have an assisted death. Each must make their own decision. What I can do is offer my perspective. I have lost count of the number of Christians who have encouraged me in publicly speaking and supporting this principle, and it happened only yesterday. Part of my motivation in supporting assisted dying is that I have been present with people who have had a death they would not have wanted for themselves. So many times I have heard families say of their loved ones, she would not have wanted this, or this is not him. In a faith community like mine, part of my pastoral role is listening, deep listening, and being present with those who are suffering, and of course, tender, sensitive prayer. As a person of faith, I see the nature of this universe as a continual cycle of death and life, of death and new birth. I speak to people about the renewal of life in this life and life evolving beyond this life. Sadly, uncontrollable fear, indignity and powerlessness are all part of such conversations. It does not need to be this way. It's also worth saying that if a relative, if a loved one, has a terrible death, then that has an impact on the bereavement process, the bereavement of, of the relatives who are, who, are, who are left behind, and it haunts them. It haunts them. In my view, we do have a say in the shape of our life and death. <clears throat> 
Christianity is committed to dignity in life for all people. The church's record in fighting injustice and poverty is considerable. And that concern for dignity does not stop and should not stop at the very end of life. Some say that in choosing an assisted death, we are playing God. Well, that's absolutely correct. And crucially, I would say, that is the way God wants it. We are made in the image of God. That means that through rational discernment, moral decision-making, and our intuitive faculties, we are empowered to make decisions, decisions of life and death. Whether it's organ transplant surgery, chemotherapy, DNR notices, relieving intolerable suffering at the end, or taking a paracetamol, we are taking decisions God invites us to take. We are not puppets, we, are free, we have free will, and we're to exercise that. So if you hear the argument, we are playing God, the answer is yes, we are, and God invites that. In the 1990s, in supporting the principle of assisted dying, Hans Kuhn said that we are co-creators with God. If people ever say that God chooses the moment of death, if that's the argument we hear, the reply must be to ask, does God choose the suffering that goes along with that death? Does God choose violent deaths for adults and children? Does God choose how long one suffers? Hours, days, weeks and months. We have to be hard in our questions to people. It is not morally defensible to say that God's ways are different from our ways. Bad theology does not give birth to good ethics. One cannot use God or the word God or the name of God as a trump card. Death should not have a final word for us. We have to examine people's reasons. Also, I would say that religious teaching has evolved always, always evolved. It has changed many, many times over the centuries. And change, I hope, is coming in our thinking on assisted dying. I've just remembered Fraser put a clock here. Uh, <laughs> very helpful of him, actually. So I'm coming to the conclusion. Going forward, I hope my own denomination, the National Church, will adopt an inclusive position in which they warmly acknowledge a diversity of opinion within the Christian family. There are differences of opinion, and what matters is that we listen to one another with respect. The church will almost certainly not come to a single view on this ethical matter, but I hope that it will be able to say that there is more than one perspective held by Christians and people of faith generally. For me, assisted dying is about dignity. Dignity means autonomy, participation in decision-making, the avoidance of anything that infantilizes or excludes us, and the minimalizing of medication. People do not want a medicalized death. People are afraid of suffering. Life is more than a beating heart. However, within the church, I hope we can accept and respect differences of opinion. I hope that um, they will take, the Church of Scotland will take a neutral stance, but I, I don't want to hold my breath. Um, in conclusion, Scotland is a secular society, a democratic society. As such, the government has a responsibility to all citizens. There needs to be space at the table for different voices. If someone does not wish for an assisted death, there would be no requirement to consider it. Equally, if someone does wish for an assisted death under the legislation, I believe the law ought to provide for that. It cannot be the case that one group of citizens is able to deny an assisted death to others simply because they are religiously, philosophically or ethically opposed to it. Thank you for the invitation.